I want to preach tonight on just this one word that's found in First and Second Peter actually seven different times. And that word is the word precious. In verse 1 here, it talks about how we have obtained like precious faith. And it talks about in verse number 4 that we've been given exceeding great and precious faith promises. And the word precious is used throughout 1st and 2nd Peter to describe Jesus Christ himself. It's used to describe the blood of Christ. It's used to describe the Word of God. It's used to describe uh, our faith in Jesus Christ. And I want to just explain to you what the word precious means. First of all, the word precious comes from the word price as in how much something costs, what the value is. So from the noun price, we get the adjective precious, meaning something that is of a great price. It has a big price tag. It's extremely valuable. And as we read through the Bible, we often see the word precious used to describe gold, silver, and of course, precious stones like rubies and diamonds and things of that nature. Now go back, if you would, to Proverbs. We're going to come back to First and Second Peter, but go back to Proverbs chapter number 3. So the word precious is often associated with things that are valuable in a physical sense, in a, in a fleshly, carnal sense. What the world would think of as precious today. They would uh, think of gold as being very precious commodity or, or uh, jewelry and, and diamonds and things like that. But the Bible tells us that spiritual things are what are actually precious in the sight of God and what ought to be precious in our sight. Now, if you would go to Proverbs chapter 3, while you're turning to Proverbs chapter 3, I'm going to read for you from Proverbs chapter 20, verse 15. The Bible says, There is gold and a multitude of rubies, but the lips of knowledge are a precious jewel. So the Bible's saying, yeah, there's gold, there are rubies, and things like that. But what's really valuable is if you can find someone that can speak to you that actually knows what they're talking about, the lips of knowledge. Someone who can actually speak the truth to you and give you real knowledge, that's way more valuable than just physical things like gold and, and rubies and things like that. Look at chapter 3 of Proverbs, it says in verse 13, Happy is the man that findeth wisdom, and the man that getteth understanding. For the merchandise of it is better than the merchandise of silver, and the gain thereof than fine gold. She is more precious than rubies, and all the things that thou canst desire are not to be compared unto her. Length of days is in her right hand, and in her left hand riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to them that lay hold upon her, and happy is every one that retaineth her. And the people of this world today are looking for all the things that are listed there. If we ask them, what is valuable to you? What do you think is, is the most expensive thing, or the thing that you'd give all your money to have? The things that the world is after are living a long life. Uh, having safety and health and prosperity and all the things that are listed in this passage. And the Bible says that a spiritual thing like wisdom that starts with the fear of the Lord is more valuable than any of those things. It's a more precious commodity. Now go to 1 Samuel chapter number 3. Go to the left in your Bible toward the beginning until you find 1 Samuel chapter number 3. The world is seeking happiness today, but the Bible says happy is the man that findeth wisdom. Amen. The Bible is seeking for riches and wealth, and the Bible says no, wisdom is more important than those things. Wisdom is found in the Word of God. He that hath the lips of knowledge that can speak to you the truth is the man of God, or the man, woman, boy, or girl who is well versed in the Word of God. That's who's going to give you real knowledge and real truth. And that is what should be our greatest desire. Now, this is a verse that has always jumped out at me when I was reading the Bible. 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1. The Bible says, And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. Now, when the Bible says here that the word of the Lord was precious because there was no open vision, it's referring to the fact that it was a rare thing in those days 
for people to hear directly from God. They had the written word of God in the form of the Torah, the first five books, the law of Moses. They also had the book of Joshua that was appended onto the law of Moses. So they had the word of God in some written scriptures, but they didn't have as much as we have today. And at this time, there weren't a lot of prophets. There weren't a lot of people that were hearing from God. And so the word of the Lord was very precious in those days. Now, what is it that makes gold precious? And, and this is all just by way of introduction to help you understand the word precious. What is it that makes gold valuable? What is it that makes rubies valuable? What is it? Rarity. Rarity. It's the fact that they're rare. I mean, if gold were everywhere, if, if a whole bunch of gold were to be found, then that would drive down the price of gold, right? And if there was a shortage of gold, then that would make gold become more precious and it would go up in value. So what the Bible is saying here is that because it was rare to hear directly from God, because it was rare to get God's word, then it was very precious unto people. Now, I'm here to tell you that the value of God's word has never changed. Okay, it's always been precious. It always will be precious precious. The Bible calls it precious in 1st and 2nd Peter. When the Bible says here that the word of the Lord was precious in those days, it's not saying that God's word had more value at that time. It's saying that it had more value to them in their minds, in their hearts. It's not that the value of God's word goes up and down like, like you could go to the goldprice.org and, you know, see what the price of gold, you know, BiblePrice.org and see like, oh, you know, God's word is, is going up in value. No, it's always the same. But the question is, how precious is the word of the Lord to you? How precious is it to you? Look, it has great value. And God can tell us over and over again, it's more precious than rubies. It's more precious than gold. Anything that you could desire in this world is of nothing compared to the word of God in value. But let me ask you this, how precious is it to you? How much do you realize that? And because of the fact that we have the entire Word of God printed in a book, because of the fact that it can be purchased at a 99 cent store, it can be purchased at the Dollar Tree, it can be purchased at Walmart, it can be purchased at the gas station, it has ceased to be precious in many people's eyes, sadly. Where this wouldn't be said today uh, of 1 Samuel 3, verse 1. Hey, in 2016, the word of the Lord was precious unto them. But just because it's readily available, just because it's easy to get to, it ought to be just as precious to us as it was here in 1 Samuel 3, where Eli gets all excited in this passage. When Samuel gets the word of God and he says, tell me the word of God, Samuel. And he said, don't you leave anything out. I forbid you to leave out a single word of what God has said to you. I want to hear every word of it. Even if it was negative, he said, tell me everything. Don't hide anything from me. Is that the desire that we have of the word of God today? Is it precious unto us that we would desire to hear every word? Now go, if you would, to 1 Peter. We're going to look at what the Bible teaches in 1 and 2 Peter. And, and the reason that I choose to preach from 1 and 2 Peter on the subject of God's Word being precious, Jesus being precious, the blood being precious, is that the word precious is used a lot in these books. That's always stood out to me when I read 1 and 2 Peter. Just for how short these books are, it uses the word precious over and over again. In fact, I'd say it's a theme of 1st and 2nd Peter. How precious our faith is. How precious Jesus is. How precious the Word of God is. What's Peter trying to tell us in these books? He's trying to get us to understand the value of what we have. And a lot of times we don't appreciate things when they're not rare. You know, when we lose something, then it becomes valuable to us. When there's a shortage of something, it's valuable. When God stops talking to people and there's no open vision back in the Old Testament, all of a sudden the word of the Lord gets precious unto people. Uh, here's my Why didn't they want to hear it when it was prevalent? So God's trying to admonish us in these books to understand the value of what we have. Not to get all caught up in the value of what this world promotes to us, but to understand the value of what we have spiritually. So let's go through 1st and 2nd Peter 
and let's look at some of the things that the Bible says are quite precious. Now go to uh, 2 Peter chapter number 1. Let's start there where we read before the preaching. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 1, the Bible reads, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So first of all, the Bible is telling us how precious the Word of God is, how precious that knowledge is. Did you notice how he kept saying the word knowledge? You see, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. The precious promises are given unto us by the Word of God. And through the Word of God, we have the knowledge that can give us everything we need. Look, look, at, look at verse 3. I love this. According as this divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue. You know, I was out soul winning this week. And I knocked on the door of a Mormon and I said, hey, do you know for sure if you died today that you're going to heaven? And he said, well, I got a question for you. Have you ever read the Book of Mormon? And I said to him, I said, do I have to read the Book of Mormon to get to heaven? He said, absolutely. Absolutely you have to read the Book of Mormon to get to heaven. You know, then I walk a few doors down the street and I knock on the door of a Roman Catholic. And he says, you know, where do you get this idea that the Bible's all you need, this sola scriptura? You know, what about the councils? What about the traditions of the fathers and the church fathers and the church councils and the pronouncements of the Pope and all these different, you know, the Bible's simply not enough. But according to the Bible, we have everything that we need that pertains to faith and godliness. Right. The Bible says we're complete in Him, in Christ. And Christ and the Word are inseparable. Amen. The Bible says in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so Christ is the Word. And the Bible tells us that we're complete in Him. And the Bible says that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Watch this. That the man of God may be perfect. Perfect meaning complete. Thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So according to the Bible, if I have the Scriptures, I'm complete. This is all I need. And not only that, he said... I am throughly furnished unto all good works. Meaning that if there's some work for me to do, that this book can't furnish me to do that work, that must not be a good work anyway. That must not be something that God expects me to do. You know, the Catholic Church wants us to do a bunch of works that aren't in this book. Where do you get this sola scriptura? Hey, I get it from the fact that this book has thoroughly furnished me unto all good works. I get that from the fact that we've been given all things that pertain unto life and godliness through God's word, through the scripture. We didn't have to wait until 325 A.D. for somebody to tell us what the Trinity is. We could just get that from 1 John 5, 7. We could just get that from right. I mean, this Catholic, when I was out sowing this week, he literally said to me, the Catholic Church gave us the Trinity. He said, they gave us the Trinity in 325 AD. I said, well, didn't we have the Trinity before that? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, didn't we have the command to go baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost? Didn't we have all the scriptures that affirm the deity of Christ? We didn't need a bunch of Catholics. We didn't need a bunch of Roman pagans to tell us what the Trinity is. And we don't need them to tell us what the Bible is. Oh, thank you for telling us that the book of Thomas isn't scripture. I didn't know that by reading it for five minutes, that it's a worthless piece of junk. We have everything we need tonight, and what a precious book that we can hold the Bible in our hand and say, this is everything we need that pertains to life and godliness. We can be truly furnished unto all good works.
with this book. We can get all knowledge and all wisdom that we need. We can get a long life. We can get all the blessings that God has for us from the Bible. These are some precious promises. This is a precious book, the Bible. What does that mean? The Bible is valuable. It's the most valuable thing we have. It's the most important thing that we have. More valuable than your car and your, your RV and your fancy house and your fancy clothes. That stuff is all junk compared to the Bible. This is what it's all about right here. But not only that, not only is the word itself precious, not only are the promises themselves precious, but the Bible actually says that our faith is precious. Because in verse 1, he said that this book is being written to everybody who has obtained like precious faith. But flip over, if you would, to, to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7. And watch this. The Bible says that the trial of your faith being more, much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of, our Je of Jesus Christ. Now, if you read this verse, you might misunderstand it at a first reading, and you might think that the trial is what's precious. The trial of faith is precious. But actually, if you slow down and look at this, it's our faith itself that is precious because look what it says. The trial of your faith being much more precious. And you say, well, you know, is it the trial of faith that's precious or is it the faith itself? We'll keep reading. Being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire. Though what be tried with fire? Our faith. Because we're talking about the trial of our faith. So the Bible here is saying that our faith is more precious than gold. And then our faith is going to be tried when we go through trials and tribulations. Just like gold could be tried to purify that gold and make it better. Well, our faith, when we go through trials and tribulations, it gets purified. It gets stronger. Our faith is increased. We grow in faith. And so our faith in Jesus Christ, our faith in the Word of God, is precious. Now, the reason I bring that up is that a lot of people try to downgrade our faith, try to downplay it or devalue it. They don't understand how precious it is. That's why when you tell people that salvation is by faith in Christ, they'll say, that's a cheap salvation. Have you heard that before? They'll say, you're preaching easy believism. And then they'll say, you're preaching cheap grace. Oh, you're one of these people that teaches cheap grace. I can't even count how many times I've been out soul winning and had somebody hit me with that term. Who's ever had somebody hit you with that term where you say, hey, it's cheap grace? They believe that salvation is purchased by their deeds also. I even saw an independent fundamental Baptist. He said, well, salvation's free, but it's not cheap. It's like, what in the world? How could it be free but not cheap? That doesn't even make any sense. And then he proceeded to say, hey, you have to repent of all your sins. You have to turn from your sins. You have to also make Jesus Lord or whatever, you know, garbage that he's adding to the simple plan of salvation. And the only person that would call salvation through faith cheap is somebody who doesn't understand the value of our faith. How precious it is. Now, we believe that our salvation was purchased by the precious blood of Christ. Look at verse 19 in the same chapter. It says, well, look at verse 18. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So these people who want to be saved by repenting of their sins, by turning over a new leaf, well, the Bible calls that works. And the Bible says that our righteousnesses are as filthy rags to God. That's a cheap grace. I mean, if you took all the works that we do, and then we put the blood of Christ over here, which one is of more value? Yeah. The blood of Christ has much more value. It's the precious blood of Christ. And if we were to take our works over here, and then we were to take our faith over here, which one is more precious? It's our faith that's more precious than gold.
And so this idea of, oh, uh, you're preaching cheap grace. No, it's the repent of your sins crowd that's teaching a cheap salvation. Right, right. They're cheapening salvation. Right. They're cheapening the blood of Christ. They're cheapening the cross of Christ. They're cheapening the death, burial, and resurrection because they're saying it's not enough. Your faith, your precious faith in Christ and your precious faith in the precious blood. They say that's not enough. I believe it's enough because I understand the value of it. I understand how valuable our faith is. I understand how valuable what we believe in our heart is. I understand how valuable it is. Uh, the blood of Christ, Jesus Christ. Those are the things that are of great value. You know, if I could choose between having my children's works or their faith, I would choose to have their faith. If I could choose whether to have my wife's works or her faith, I would choose her faith. I would choose, I, you know, Proverbs says, son, give me thy heart. You know, I want my wife's heart. I want my children's heart. Why? That's more valuable than just outward deeds. What's in the heart What's on the inside is most valuable, the soul, the spirit. That's more valuable than that which is outward and carnal. And so this cheap grace is, is such a... Anybody who says that is probably just not saved. Anybody who says that. Even, you know, I mean, I can't imagine how a saved person could cheapen salvation like that or cheapen grace like that, cheapen faith. It, to me, it seems like they just don't even understand the value at all to say something like that. But not only is, the, is our faith precious, not only is the, the blood precious, not only is the Word of God precious, but Jesus Christ Himself, the Bible says, is precious. Now look, if you would, at 1 Peter chapter number 2, verses 4-7. through 7. The Bible says, To whom coming, as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of them, but chosen of God, and precious ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ wherefore also it is contained in the scripture behold I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone elect precious and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded unto you therefore which believe he is precious but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. The Bible says to us that believe on Jesus, He is precious. To the world, He's basically rejected. He's disallowed. He's unwanted. But to us, He's precious. And I love the songs in the hymnal that use the word precious. One of my favorite songs in the hymnal is, Take the name of Jesus with you. Child of sorrow and of woe, it will joy and comfort give you. Take it then where'er you go. Precious name, oh how sweet. Hope of earth and joy of heaven. Precious name, oh how sweet. Hope of earth and joy of heaven. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Precious is what I'm talking about. Precious is what I'm preaching about tonight. But sadly today, the word precious would normally come out of somebody's mouth in regard to just money. Just the, you know, precious commodities. Precious stones. Precious jewels. That's what the world is after today. That's what the world thinks is valuable. That which is carnal. That which is of the flesh. And children especially, and you know, I, I've just, I've been burdened lately just thinking about the children of our church. Because, you know, I love my children and I'm, and I'm watching my children grow up and they're getting older and there's more of them. So there's more to think about. And I look around at all the children that are being born and all the babies and all the toddlers and the young teenagers now as they're growing up. And I think about all the children in our church and my greatest fear is that they would not appreciate. And notice how the word appreciate comes from precious, the price. My greatest fear is that my children and the other children of our church would not appreciate what they've been given. Because it's so common to them. 
because it's not rare. You know, to them, it's just, well, yeah, we go to church and we hear all this biblical preaching. And of course, we sing hymns. Of course, we read the Bible. And uh, I mean, of course, my parents are married to each other. And of course, they raise us and love each other. And I mean, of course, there's, you know, high quality food on the table. And of course, we live in a nice, you know, it's so easy when you're just given everything to not appreciate it. When you don't have to fight for it. You know, I think about how many things from the Bible I learned on my own. Where nobody explained it to me and I struggled and I figured it out on my own. Therefore, those things have value to me. I think about all the things I've learned reading the Bible on my own and they had value to me because I worked to get them. I think about the times that I spent in churches that were weak on doctrine, that were weak on salvation, weak on soul winning, weak on separation, sermons that would have like one Bible verse in them or two Bible verses in them. Just shallow preaching. And then you get under some preaching that actually uses the Bible a lot and you really appreciate it. I mean, you're like, wow, this is great. I mean, this preaching is teaching me so much because there's so much Bible in it and I'm learning so much doctrine. And man, it's so great to be in a church where everybody just gets the simple truth that salvation is by faith in Jesus. Hello, that he did everything. And that we just receive it with the faith of a child and that we don't have to work for it or do it. I mean, people who've been in the church that was constantly confusing them with, well, you got to repent of your sins or, well, if you're still living the same way, yeah. you're not saved. You know, they really appreciate that yep. Yep. when they get into a church that's right on that. You know, people who are in another country and they couldn't get a Bible or the Bible in their language was translated by some goofball missionary that was more interested in hunting, you know, wild zebras and elephants that he didn't do a good job translating their Bible. And, you know, when they get a King James and when they start reading it, it's precious to them. I mean, it, it means something to them. It's a big deal to them. And, you know, I pray that you children over all you children over here and all you children around here. I hope that you don't grow up not understanding the value of what you have in your family and the value of what you have with your parents and the value of your church and the value of the Bible and the value of everything that you have. And then you'll go out into the world and see all the junk and the garbage and the filth that they have to offer and think, oh, that's precious. That's what's valuable. You'll see the casinos and you'll see the gold and the glam and the glitter and the, and the shining junk that the world offers you, the fool's gold of this world. And you'll see that and think, oh, that's what I want to spend my life going after. I want to pursue that. I want to pursue the whorish woman. I want to pursue wealth. I want to be like, like a Robert Kiyosaki or whatever that guy's name is. Or I want to be like a Donald Trump. Or I want to be, you know, a millionaire. And I want to follow up. You know, I heard some guy give some speech the other day. He's talking about living the good life. But when he said the good life, you know what he means? Having money. That's not the good life, friend. The good life is the Christian life. The good life is the life with Jesus. The good life is a life in church. The good life is the life when you stay married. The good life is the life when you raise your children and you're faithful to your wife and faithful to your children and faithful to your job and faithful to your church. That's the good life. Amen. Amen. Tell me about a good life that these worldly millionaires are living. Listen, kids, it's junk. And I want you tonight to realize the value of Jesus, the value of the blood of Christ, the value of the promises in the Bible, the value of your faith in Christ. And you know what? If you don't have faith in Christ tonight, kids, if you don't have the faith, if you haven't obtained like precious faith with me and the others that are here, you have nothing. If you don't have that, you have nothing. I don't care how much money is in your wallet. 
I don't care what kind of car is in the driveway. I don't care what kind of house you live in. If you haven't obtained that like precious faith, then you have nothing and your life is a worthless piece of junk. And so we need to realize tonight, and I think it's what Peter is trying to get across. We need to realize the value of what we have. We need to understand that Jesus and the Bible and salvation and our faith are the things that are the most precious in this world. And we should thank God every day. And don't be like the people who lived in periods where the Bible was prevalent and then it wasn't precious. And then God had to, God had to hold back the Word of God for them to start appreciating it again in the days of Samuel. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for all the exceeding great precious promises you've given us, Lord. We thank you for the, the, the precious gift of, of your Son, Father. We, we thank you for the blood. We thank you for salvation. We thank you for the Word, Lord. Help us to appreciate it, take it off the shelf, read it, and to realize that all the junk that the world offers is just, it, it's dung in comparison with what we have in Christ. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen.